Thankful to see everybody this morning. Thankful for God's grace and mercy in our lives. Go back to see Dr. Samuelson Tuesday. Hopefully, I'm going to be able to get rid of this thing and start doing a little strengthening and get to where I can carry my book again. <laughs> but reading reading God's word is reading God's word, whether it's whether it's on my app on the phone or, or out of the Bible. So we're thankful. I, sometimes I'm made particularly thankful for technology, and this is one of those times. It's just a whole lot easier to, to handle my phone than it is to try to, to try to carry a book right with me right now. We'll invite you to turn this morning, if you will, to the book of Malachi. Chapter 3. And chapter 3 begins with the words of the Lord through the mouth of the prophet. And he says, Behold, sit up and pay attention. You know, sometimes we get a little lackadaisical about our approach to God's Word, don't we? Sometimes we make it a point, you know, we, we, we set aside a time and, and, and we say, all right, this is my time to read God's Word, and, and, and that's wonderful, and, 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 you know, hopefully we're faithful to that and we do that. And that's a wonderful thing. And it's a great habit to be into as long as reading his word itself doesn't just become habit. As long as it's not something that it's on our to-do list and we're just checking off the box. Okay, I read God's word. We always ought to read God's word first and foremost with the attitude of behold. Whatever it is we're reading in his word, wherever it is we're reading in his word, even if that word is not there, we should make it a practice to center ourselves a little bit and, 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 and to say a little prayer and, and to seek God's face and to, to make it a point that we're going to sit up and take notice to what God's word is saying. Behold, I will send my messenger. And he shall prepare the way before me. I will send my messenger. And let me assure you this morning that though I, I hope and pray that if I, as I stand before you, that it's because the Lord has called me and the Lord has sent me and the Lord has given me a message. I'm not the messenger that he's referring to here. I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. So, this, I hope, begins to clarify for us now who it is that the messenger is. The messenger is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God promises this. He said, I will send my messenger. Amen. He will come and he will speak those things that are right and true and holy concerning me. This is something I will do. God didn't say, I will send my messenger if. Or I will send my messenger because of something that you have done. He said, I will send my messenger. And he shall prepare the way before me. I will send my messenger. And he will come with a message of the covenant. He shall prepare before me the way that my people 
people should walk according to my grace and my mercy and my majesty, the Lord whom ye seek. Child of God, who do you come here seeking this morning? I hope it wasn't me. Because I'm not worth your time. I'll just tell you that right now. And it's good to see one another and to have fellowship. We always look forward to look forward to seeing the folks that we're at church with every Sunday. We look forward to when the Lord's pleased to send us new faces that we haven't seen before. And everybody looks forward to seeing everybody. But that's not why we came here. That's not why we're here today. I trust that we have come today being bound under God's word that the Lord whom ye seek, that we have come today, and in and, and, and all honesty that we arise from our beds every day, first and foremost seeking the Lord our God and our Redeemer Jesus Christ through the presence of the Holy Ghost in our lives, that each and every day that we arise from our beds, that first and foremost we seek him so that we might walk uprightly so that our dealings whether it, it was with family or friends or at work or whatever it might be that our dealings are that which is honoring and glorifying unto God and not caught up in the ways and the attitudes of the world the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple What does that tell you? Don't get lazy. Don't get complacent. Because he hasn't shown up yet, doesn't mean he won't show up before the next breath. And this, you know, this is what he told us. Jesus himself said, watch. For he comes as a thief in the night to watch, to pay attention, to, to always be ready. And that, that takes a level of diligence that it only comes to us by the grace and the mercy of God to always stand ready for the sudden coming of our Lord and Savior. I'm so thankful when, whenever we have, by His grace and mercy, prayed and, and sung hymns of praise and, and spoke of His goodness and His greatness, and we find suddenly that He's in our midst. That we hear him. As we're saying, blessed be the name of the Lord. Y'all sang that like folks that meant it this morning. I heard, I heard joy in that. I heard worship in that. I heard praise in that. I heard the Lord in that. What a glorious thing. What a blessed thing to understand and to feel and to bear witness to the fact that God inhabits the praise of his people. That he dwells in your praise. That he lives in your praise. Shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. And you notice he didn't tell them that they delighted in the covenant. They delighted in the messenger. You see, we need to be careful that we don't get caught up in being, being delighted in our, in, in our name or in our congregation or in the people. We need, to be, we need to always be delighted with the messenger. We need to be delighted with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ regardless of, of, of whether we're assembled at Providence Primitive Baptist Church or whether we're sitting in Hardy's having a cup of coffee and and and, and begin to, I, I've had this happen a time too. You start over here to a, a conversation and they're talking loud enough and saying some things to, to that, that are honoring and glorifying God enough that you're not afraid to join in and, and, and bear witness and, and bear testimony with them. And the first thing you know, you got brothers and sisters sitting there talking with you and drinking coffee, and you probably you may leave and not even know their names. Isn't it amazing that we've got brothers and sisters in this world we don't have a clue what their name is? 
We may never know their name here, but we know their brothers and sisters because they delight in the same messenger that we delight in. What a glorious thing that is. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. This is God's promise. I know, I know it was his promise to Israel in that day that Jesus was coming, that their Messiah would come. But I want to assure you that, that there is an essence in this that it is still true to us today. Behold, he shall come. He still is, he, he comes in the lives of his children. Some he comes to maybe for the for the, the first time that he manifests. We, we've all had that experience, haven't we? That first time that he made himself manifest unto us and calls us to know. But how many times since, child of God, has he come to us? How many times over the years have we found ourselves in need of him? And behold, he shall come. We find that God's promise is still true is still being fulfilled. That when we look for the messenger, <clears throat> he comes. When our delight is in the messenger, he comes. Because you see, if I'm delighted with the messenger, then I'm going to receive the message. And the message might not always be something I'd otherwise want to hear. But I know if this messenger brings that message that it's for my good and for God's glory, and I needed it. <clears throat> but who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's so. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't live to see him come. That should be obvious to us by now. That doesn't mean that we can't live in his presence. That should be obvious to us by now. What it does mean is that I cannot boast of myself and live in his presence. I cannot cling to my righteousness and live in his presence. I cannot cling to my thoughts and my judgments and my ways and live in his presence because he's like a refiner's fire. He's going to burn all that away. He's like fuller soap. He's going to take all the stain out. He's going to get rid of, of, of all the dross. He is going to totally and utterly consume. This is what the coming of the messenger does in our lives. Every time he comes, he consumes more of that dross that we contend with. Now, I know eternally, he, he is, he, we, are, we are clean every week. But I haven't entered my eternal home yet. I haven't entered my eternal house yet. It's mine. I have every confidence in it. I have every belief in it. I'm thankful for it. I praise God for it. But right now, I'm still in this old house of clay. And I still need refining. And I know I've shared this with you before, but I'm going to share it again. It, it is a precious thought to me that in that day and time, when a refiner sat down to refine silver, and as he refined it, from time to time, he would go and look at his reflection in that silver. And do you know when he knew it was refined enough? Most all of us have had, have had the experience of, of looking at an old mirror, and you know how the, the flaws that you see in that reflection when it comes back to you? A refiner of silver knew how long and how much heat to apply. And what he kept going back and looking for was his visage, his countenance, his face reflected back to him unmarred by any dross in the silver. Child of God, how wonderful it ought to be to us to know that our Lord will continually put us in the fire, that he will continually draw us in, in, in and, and as the potter remold and remake us as much as is necessary knowing that each and every time that he does that we get that much closer 
to bear the image of the heavenly without flaw and without fail. What a wonderful thing. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi. Remember, this is the priesthood. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And you say, well, you know, I'm Irish. There, 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 as far as I know, there's not any Jewish lineage in me. So what does this have to do with me? But I find the scripture teaching us that we have been made kings and priests unto God. Why well, was it that he was refining the why why he named Levi and didn't remain and didn't name any of the other tribes? Because he was talking directly to those that he had called and caused to serve him in his holy temple. And I will assure you to this day that he still labors diligently, refines, and, and, and deals with those that he has called to serve him in his holy temple. Now to me it's obvious that that's not all of his children. Because first of all, that's the pattern he gave us. There were 12 tribes, only one of them was obligated, if you will, to the temple. The other 11 were his too. The other 11 were, were, were considered in the covenant. But he had not called them to serve the temple, to serve the place where his messenger was going to come and dwell, to serve in the place where his messenger was going to come and prepare the way before him. To this day, there are those, I am fully persuaded, there are those that the Lord has called to serve him and to honor him and to glorify his name, and they are only a remnant of all of his people that are in the world. Because I'm going to promise you something. The, the scripture tells us that, that the people of God are as innumerable as the sands of the sea and the stars of heaven. Well, now I know there's not that many of us in the world right this minute, but I will assure you this, if they are that numerous, there's more than enough of God's children to overflow our meeting houses. And the fact that they're not overflowing pretty much assures me that God's got people out there that he has not called to come and serve in his temple. So this teaching and this instruction and this promise is to those that he has called and set apart. I hope you understand this morning that if you have been blessed to serve him, it's because he has called you to serve him. He has called you to worship him. He has called you to walk in this path. He has set you apart. I don't know what that says to you, child. But to consider that the God of heaven and earth would look at an old worm like me and set me apart to serve and worship him. When you understand, when you are blessed by God to truly understand how unbelievable that is outside of his grace and mercy, then you can truly sing Amazing Grace. He does this, he purges us as gold and silver that we may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. I'm going to assure you that whatever we have to offer unto the Lord this day, we offer in righteousness. Not our righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And until he purges us, until he burns that old self-righteousness out of us, we don't understand that we don't have any that's worth anything. We don't understand how vile and how wretched our righteousness is. As filthy 
rags, the scripture says. It's not fit for anything. It's unclean. What good is an unclean righteousness? We have none. That, that, that's about, you know, if my righteousness is as filthy rags, we, we talked a little bit about this Wednesday night. It, it's amazingly that, the, the, you know, the scripture tells us what man is. And I don't know how people can read this and then get around it that, that man can make himself something other than. The scripture says that man in his best state is altogether vanity. Don't make us very worse very much, does it? Man in his best state is altogether vanity. We like to look back and, 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 and think about Adam there in the garden before the transgression and how wonderful it all was and how good it all was and, and how amazing it all was. And I'm not saying it wasn't, but what I'm telling you is this. That was when man was in his best state. Man has never, uh, from, from, from a, a, a human standpoint, man has never been in a better condition than what Adam was in in the garden. And in his best state, he was still before God altogether vanity. Adam lived for a while without sin. I live back. Adam lived without sin. That's not something you and I can say. There's not a one of us that's ever come into this world that can say that we have lived without sinning. Man in his best state is altogether vanity. So what am I going to brag about before God? What am I going to do that, that's going to make God, that, that's going to obligate God to me? If Adam, without transgression, was altogether vanity, how can I think that I'm going to be anything other than outside of the grace and the mercy and the righteousness of Jesus Christ? <clears throat> Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. Whenever the priests of God, whenever his kings and priests are refined to the point that they can offer in righteousness, because I know that I can't claim any, any glory for it. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hiring in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. You want to live righteously? Then it begins by living in the fear of the Lord. It begins by living in the fear of the Lord. And I'm not talking about, again, I've said this to you many times. I'm sure other people have too. I'm going to say it to you again. I want you to hold on to this. That it's not about being terrified of God as though, as though he were, were, were a grizzly bear fixing to eat me. It's not that kind of terror. I was never afraid that my daddy was going to disown me. Might have been a time for him in my life he probably should have, but I was never afraid that he was going to. There were times that, that, that he corrected me, and some of those times were, were, were with, with a good keen switch. And I'm not going to tell you for a minute that I looked forward to that, but there was never a time that I thought he didn't love me. There was never a time when I was afraid he was going to beat me to death. The terror, 
that I was blessed to feel. Always came from knowing that I had not done my best for him and the things that he had given me to do. I was far more afraid of the disappointment in his eyes than I was the switch in his hand. We need to be afraid. We need to have a good, healthy fear of the Lord. I'm not afraid he's going to cast me off forever. I'm not afraid he's going to forget. I'm going to tell you something. If God's ever loved you, he still does, and he always will. And you can't find a point in your life where you can say, well, this is when God started loving me. You might find a point in your life where you say, this is when I started knowing that God loves me. But you can't find the point in your life when you say, this is when God started loving me because the scripture says he's loved you with an everlasting love. There is no point in which he started loving you. There is no point in which he has ever not loved you. If you want to do that which is right in the sight of the Lord, just remember how much it hurts to know that you have not done that which is right in the sight of the Lord. Consider his holy and reverential fear first and foremost, and that will deliver us from all of the, literally, it will deliver us from all of these other things. I know something, you go in the restaurant sometimes and, 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 and the service is, is maybe less than, than you know, Maybe less than deserving of a tip. <laughs> and maybe you want to just take the hide right off of whoever it is that's supposed to be serving you because pretty much all they've done is ignored you, throwed your food on the table and, and walked off and, and, and didn't bring the right food to start with or it wasn't cooked the way you wanted it. Or, you know, they, how many, they, you know, however many things go wrong with it was wrong with it and you were just sitting there downright aggravated and the thing you wanted to do was just give them a good old big chunk of your mind. Well, first of all, let me advise you, keep it. You know what I mean. Stop and think, first of all, about the fear of the Lord. How many times have we failed in waiting on Him? And you don't know what that young man or young woman may be going through. You don't know why they're old enough to be retired and still waiting tables. You don't know what they're facing. You don't know what they're up against. You don't know how hard they might have struggled just to show up that day. If we'll remember first the fear of the Lord before we open our mouth, kinder things will come out than what we might have been originally thinking. One small example. When you come to church, come with joy. Come with expectation. Come with anticipation. I hope that God has been good enough to us all that we can get up on Sunday morning and think about going to church and it's not like, man, I got here to go to church. I sure would like to have that one more cup. You know, the ball game's going to come on at 11. Thank you, God, that you have afforded me a place where I can come and sit down with like-minded brothers and sisters and bow my head in your holy presence and lift my heart and my voice in hymns of praise unto you and speak of your goodness and your mercy with joy and thanksgiving. You want to offer something in righteousness to the Lord? There's your, there's your righteous offering. For I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. I know I've preached from that here before. You just hang around. I'll probably preach from it again. <laughs> but consider this. I am the Lord. Not, 
I'd like to be, not I want to be, not I will if you'll let me. I am the Lord. I change not. We don't know how thankful we ought to be for that. God was righteous in the beginning, and he has always been and always will be righteous. God was faithful in the beginning. He always has been and always will be faithful. God's perfect in the beginning. He's perfect now, and he always will be. He does not change. He, he does not fail. God has never failed. Now, you look around and you, and you look at the way things are in the world. So maybe you sometimes you look at the things in, the way things are in, you, in your life. And, and, and maybe sometimes we're tempted to think, well, well God failed. But God doesn't fail. <clears throat> because the path didn't look like I thought it was going to, doesn't mean that God has failed. Because I had to endure some things that I didn't expect to endure does not mean that God has failed. Lord, bless me to speak to the folks at Union Grove about the fact that God's way is perfect. You think about Elijah and the situation that he found himself in. But God's way is perfect. It brought Elijah exactly to the place that Elijah needed to be to give honor and glory unto God and to see God's power poured out upon the false prophets to see the offering accepted. You think about that. He let them have all day. The, the prophets of Baal had all day to call their God to take up their sacrifice. And they wailed and hollered and jumped around and cut themselves and bled all over the place and and and, and evening come and by that point I think Elijah was almost beginning to enjoy himself because he, he he got you know he kind of got to egging them on a little bit. He said, Cry louder, maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's going on a trip. And when the time came for Elijah to make his offering unto God. He had him to bring water and pour over the offering and had him dig a ditch around it. Pour over the, until the ditch ran full. I mean, he soaked this thing so much that, that it, you know, it should have caught fire for days. <clears throat> and then he called upon the living God. fire came down and consumed the offering and the altar and licked up the water out of the ditch. God's way is perfect. I am the Lord. I <coughs> change not. David recognized that in one place when, he's, when he said, though it be not so with my house, God is always faithful. What he was saying was, I'm not always faithful. I recognize that I'm not always faithful. I confess that I'm not always faithful. But I tell you that in spite of that, God, God's faithfulness is not contingent upon my faithfulness. Aren't we thankful for that? God's love is not contingent upon my love. God's grace and mercy is not contingent upon my confidence in his grace and mercy. I am the Lord. I change not. And this is why we're still here. It's because God doesn't change. God's faithful. I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. What God, what God say? If I was a changeable God, I'd look at the way you've lived and the way you've done and I'd say, hmm, I, 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 I've had none of that. It's because I don't change that you are not destroyed. How wondrous. That song, How Great Is Our There's a song called How Great Is Our God. That's a 
question that we really can't answer. <laughs> because he's able to do above all that we think or believe. Think about that. Your greatest imagination. I heard a minister one time say that the child would come and ask him if their, if their puppy went to hell. <coughs> He said, I didn't really know how to answer that. He said, but I finally just had to tell him, I said, you, you, just, ima you just imagine what it would take for heaven to be the most wonderful place you've ever been. And then just know it's going to be a thousand times better than that. <laughs> Think about it. There are a lot of things about heaven we don't understand. But I'm sure of this, that our God is able to do above all that we think or believe. And that everything, even in this world, I can assure you, everything that he has had in store for me thus far in my life has been far beyond what I could have imagined. Far beyond what I ever dreamed would be possible. Far beyond what I ever thought that I might enjoy. And that being true, how in the world can I have any imagination about what eternity in his presence is going to be like? I can't tell you I look forward to it. But until then, I look forward to the days he has for me here. May God bless him.